Uh, you're very welcome uh, to yet another of one of these occasions where we really dig into the things that are going on around us. And we've been trying to look with some optimism uh, about where we are, and I have to say that's not always very easy. Um, but we've got a, a real expert with us today, uh, Professor John Tong, who many of you will uh, have seen him or heard him, TV or radio, as a, a very um, respected political commentator. Um, and although he lives over in England, uh, John spends a great deal of his time here. He does tell me he's very glad to be in Armagh. Uh, because Belfast is, of course, you know, the centre of the universe for these things. Uh, so it's great to, to have him here and to welcome him. Uh, John's uh, list of publications is much too long uh, for me to go through every single one. But suffice it to say, his books uh, include analysis of um, the uh, DUP, the Unions Parties generally, the SDLP, uh, Sinn Féin, uh, and his very latest um, publication, which is due out in the autumn, will be on the Alliance Party, so he definitely covers everything. <laughs> uh, and he also, of course, um, comments on election results and so forth uh, quite a lot. He has been known to give predictions, and indeed, I think the ba Daily Mail uh, dubbed him as uh, Mystic Meg one time, because, you know, so we can depend on them. <laughs> you know? OK, so please give a very wa warm welcome to Professor John Tong. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Great to see everyone here. Uh, thanks very much to, to Myrtle for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm not sure being lauded uh, by the Daily Mail is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a potential career ender uh, in, in academia, if ever there was one. Uh, this is very different from a normal uh, university lecture because the audience is actually in place at the start rather than coming in in desultory fashion in dribs and drabs with a hangover uh, throughout and not always staying, although that's, that is also an option to, uh, for you. OK. Uh, this morning, what I want to do for the next sort of 30, 35 minutes is talk about uh, where we're at in Northern Irish politics. Uh, I won't be uh, offering necessarily solutions. Uh, I'll be sort of surveying uh, where we're at rather than necessarily offering solutions. That, that would involve taking uh, hard decisions. I, I couldn't even decide whether to wear a tie, let alone take, a, <laughs> take, take hard decisions. Uh, and I do, if there's one thing that might unite you all, it, it, but it's a situation I want to avoid is being the, uh, the English person coming over, telling you where it's at and what to do. You, you've got a Secretary of State for that. So, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I rest my case. Um, so, what I want to do is, is look at, I mean, obviously, the 25th, uh, it has felt like a, a bit, I'm really grateful to John Hewitt Society. Goodness knows how you manage this week's events, just so packed, fantastic, fantastic programme. Um, I've been sort of busy this, this year, obviously, with the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. It feels like a 25th anniversary sort of tour going via Lyndon Hall, John Hewitt Society, etc., looking at assessing uh, the state of the Good Friday Agreement and perhaps looking ahead to what the next 25 years uh, will bring. And I want to really start, because it's easy to be negative about things, I do want to start on a positive note, um, because there's been plenty of naysaying. Uh, you can't win, really, because a lot of people love that conference, that major three-day conference at Queen's, but some people said it was too smug and complacent. Um, uh, people have been trying to pick holes in the Good Friday Agreement. I think we should start on a, on a positive note uh, this morning because it is a fantastic peace deal. It is a deal that's been lauded uh, around the globe. Uh, and, you know, the, the most important single piece on any slide this morning, and I promise not to bombard you with too many PowerPoints. I've axed about six of them over breakfast this morning. Um, but look at the security uh, situation. If there's one single most important line on any of the slides, it's that top one today. If you look at the death toll, 3,559 deaths prior, uh, in the 25 years prior to the Good Friday Agreement, 165, you know, no peace in any peace process globally is perfect. There are always spoiler groups. But actually the situation in Northern Ireland has been he very healthy in security terms in <coughs> You know, really hugely reducing the death toll, and of course, though, you know, reducing the, the injury toll. Okay. Uh, a second thing that's often avoided is well, people say, well, you know, peace was inevitable in the 1990s. For th those of us who, who lived through it, uh, I remember the optimism that was there for peace in the 1990s. It was for, and it's hard to credit now, Israel-Palestine and the Oslo Accords. People said Northern Ireland, 
there'll never be peace. I mean, that, that was the common line of the 1990s. You know, and it proved to be wrong that the people, the doom mongers, the naysayers, were, were proved wrong, that, that you had a peace process that was uh, successful. And people said, well, it was a sort of linear route to peace. Uh, no, there wasn't. If you look at, I went back to the, the 1998 Northern Ireland referendum survey, looking at public opinion. First of all, it was quite a close squeak. Uh, if you look at the level of support for the Good Friday Agreement, 71% voted in favour, but it was only 57% uh, amongst Protestants. But perhaps more significantly, if you look at what united both Protestant yes voters in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and no voters, neither group thought it would lead to a lasting peace. They were sceptical. You know, so it was a huge leap of faith on the yes side. And if you also look on the Republican side, again, only a minority of Republicans, if you look at the data, only about 30 odd percent of Republicans believed that the Good Friday Agreement would bring about a lasting peace. So people were taking a leap in the dark here. They were voting in favor of a deal. Republicans overwhelmingly voted in favor, a majority of, of, of Protestants or Unionists uh, were voting in, in favor of a deal that they thought, well, you know, this, this is a big punt. This is this might not work, but we'll still, we'll still back it. So there was no easy linear route uh, to peace at all. I think a third point to make is that the agreement for all its faults has retained its popular legitimacy. If there was a referendum tomorrow, I'd be pretty confident, you don't need to be uh, mystic Meg uh, to, to bring this one, that there would be uh, a vote in favour again uh, of the deal. Uh, people might grumble about the agreement, but you know, show us the alternative. Fourthly, and this, this is stretching it, <laughs> When the institutions function, uh, they do function quite well. <laughs> but this, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, I know I'm stretching it. Um, when they're in place, <laughs> bear with me, uh, they, the volume of legislation is actually pretty good. It was almost as much in that honeymoon period of devolution, 2007 to 2016, when you had the unlikely uh, uh, Paisley McGuinness axis and followed by the Robinson McGuinness axis, which was based upon pragmatism, 2007 to 2016, the Northern Ireland Assembly passed nearly as much legislation as did the Scottish Parliament, which is one of the most powerful devolved parliaments uh, anywhere in Europe. Uh, and most of the legislation was actually, I don't know it's hard to credit, but, but actually quite, quite reasonable, and it passed far more than uh, the Welsh Assembly as it was at the time. I think a more convincing point is probably the final one there that you see in front of you, that what, it might be incredible, but if you, if you listen to the Vox Pops, you know, in, in the Belfast Telegraph, a paper I much like, I should say, but, um, you know, you would see uh, a lot of negativity towards the institutions, quite understandably, a lot of cynicism. But when you actually do the surveys, we've done the last four Northern Ireland general election surveys, and we've asked, should the Assembly and Executive be restored? You get overwhelming majorities in favour of that and from, from the public. They want the institutions back. So in other words, people have not given up on the institutions. They might be cynical about how they work or don't work. They might be cynical about the dysfunctionality of them. But they haven't actually given up on the institutions themselves. When you know, the majorities uh, in favour of their restoration have been 80% plus in every survey uh, that we've done. And we're not leading, you know, we just ask the question, do you, do you, want, do you want them back? So people don't see an alternative to devolution. They don't see an alternative either to, to power sharing when you, when you actually uh, ask them the questions uh, on this. But it's understandable that they are, they are cynical uh, about some of the functioning. But, you know, let's be candid here in terms of where we're at. Um, I've actually got a count. I'm sad enough to actually have a counter, a day counter in my office on the institutions uh, and the, the length of time that they've been absent. Okay? So, uh, you know, to be fair, we, we take it from the 2nd of December 1999, the day that uh, power was actually devolved to the political institutions, and they've been down for 3,221 3, days of 8,632, 37% and rising. Okay? I think the more damning statistics, that's bad, but you know, you can say, well, excuses, you know, uh, it was a society coming out of conflict, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think what's really damning is the fact that in the last five years, the institutions have been down more than in the first five years after the creation devolution, when you could make reasonable excuses that this was you know, an immediate post-conflict society. Um, and no real um, guarantee they'll be back anytime soon. I, I did always think it was a leap of faith that everyone sort of assumed the DUP would be back in the autumn. Well, why? I remember doing the local elections and I think it was asked by Mark Carruthers, uh, would the institutions come back? Madeline Sunday politics at that, the, the weekend that, of the local elections. And uh, 
I said I'd give it a 55-45 chance, was what I put it at. So slightly more likely than not, but no more than that. I mean, uh, when people assume the DUP will come back, well, why were they going to come back if they're not going to get the political cover that they want? And that's, you know, that is, is disturbing because we're only in the foothills of a hiatus. If you think that, you know, I remember one of my favourite moments coming, coming over here, and I, I, you know, go back to Myrtle's introduction. I'm, I'm glad we're in Armagh because I'm always in Belfast. I could recite the EasyJet timetable, Liverpool to, to Belfast flights. But I remember coming over here once uh, in 2003 to an election to an assembly that never existed. You know, I mean, that's what, what we're at. We had a four and a half year hiatus from 2002 to 2007 without any institution. So, okay, the institutions have been down since February uh, 2022. That, that's nothing in. Uh, assembly terms, you know, so the DUP may tough it out. I think the Westminster election could be the thing that concentrates minds. I think, you know, it might be a cynical view, but ultimately uh, I think the DUP will take a decision based upon calculations in terms of defending, for example, uh, Gavin Robinson's East Belfast seat. That, that, that will also factor into the DUP's calculations in terms of when uh, they go, go back. That's not to say that their opposition to the Windsor framework isn't sincere. It, it is. Okay, so, you know, the last five years has been pretty bleak in terms of suspension. We have 1,183 days, uh, including today. Uh, only two of the seven assembly terms have run their full course, and twice uh, we've had no institutions. Right. Um, this, I think, is an understated part of the problem as, as well. The Northern Ireland Assembly could have been pretty powerful. I mean, it could have been a, a strong, devolved institution. But with the and I, I don't underplay it, with the notable uh, <clears throat> exception of the devolution of policing and justice, which given the history of this place was uh, you know, a, a, a notable feat, but the failure to gain significant powers uh, since 1998, 1999, I think is, is a damning indictment of what has gone on. Uh, if you think of the Welsh Assembly, which was a Mickey Mouse, let's be honest, Mickey Mouse, fairly Tim Pot, county council style model of devolution that was introduced by the Blair government really is an afterthought in many ways to the Scottish Parliament and you see where that is, how that has progressed to Senate Cymru, strong, powerful, legislating Parliament that is making a difference in real terms for Welsh people. Think about the Scottish Parliament which has grown in powers partly because of the threat of independence but it's grown in powers and look where the Northern Ireland Assembly has. Not one significant piece of power has been transferred since 2010 to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's, it's gloomy. And <clears throat> if any of the 7% of people who believe the executive has functioned well as, as a government uh, are in here, if they'd like to reveal uh, who they are, <laughs> I want to meet these people because they are life. I thought I was a sunny optimist in life, but these people are, take it to a new level. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's the, you know, a fairly grim balance sheet. However, however, you know, we talk about Northern Ireland being a, you know, a place apart. It isn't. It isn't. Uh, power sharing in ethnically, ethno-national, ethno-religiously divided societies, power sharing struggles in all those polities. Northern Ireland is not exceptional. And there's been a good contest between Northern Ireland and Belgium as to who's been without devolved government for the longest, for who's been without government for the longest. Where well, it did quite make me smile that <laughs> there were some people in Northern Ireland who felt quite piqued that they didn't make the Guinness Book of Records uh, on the grounds that Belgium had been without uh, devolved government for, for longer. Well, you have serious linguistic, ethno-linguistic divisions between uh, uh, Flemish speakers and French-speaking populations, which has led to, to no long periods of no government in Belgium, where the divisions are not as acute as they are here. In Bosnia, Deadlock is, is a feature, and Bosnia has got more presence than any other country. Got the, if you think the political apparatus is, is complicated here with the first and deputy first minister, try your 14 presidents in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, try your, how, I forget how many ethnic cantons there are, and you often have political paralysis. And you've got the regular threat of secession by the Serbs, who say that you know, they should not be integrated further into Bosnia. It's in breach of the Dayton Agreement, which preceded the Good Friday Agreement by three years. So... Again, consociational enforced power sharing systems, they're vulnerable to episodic crisis because they're built upon uh, ethnic identity and parties are elected to represent one particular group. They're not elected to represent, you know, in this case, Bosnia as a whole. In the same way, you know, the DUP or Sinn Féin are not elected 
for the, you know, for the, necessarily for the good of Northern Ireland as a whole. They're elected to, they, they might, they would deny that, uh, but perhaps, but, you know, there are, parties are at least based upon communal interest as much as uh, common interest. You can make a strong case uh, for that. Iraq, again, another example, um, where uh, Iraq, again, if you think the system's bad here, have a look at Iraq where not only the parties, the civil servants might be running the place here. In Iraq, the parties have been choosing the civil servants who are going to run their ministry. So you get, talk about party fiefdoms here with a party in control of a particular ministry when, when they're in place. But in Iraq, multiply that uh, several times. And in Lebanon, you know, a more chronic instability uh, where you have fixed places really for each uh, ethno-religious group. So Northern Ireland is not unique. The problem, if you want a power sharing system in Northern Ireland and people are not coming up with alternatives pending the resolution of the constitutional question as laid out in the Good Friday Agreement uh, by uh, a referendum. If you want power sharing, then, you know, instability is sadly sort of baked in and collapses of government are almost unavoidable. I mean, if someone wants to put their hand up and tell me which has been a highly stable, uh, continuous government consociational power sharing system, be genuinely interested to hear. There might be small uh, examples globally, but generally they are um, problematic because these are acutely divided societies. I think part of the problem with the Good Friday Agreement is that not everyone has perceived it as, uh, as being equal in its treatment, again, fairly or unfairly, and I, I would argue it is broadly equal in terms of how it has treated uh, both of the main communities um, without wishing to annoy alliance uh, people here and don't want to annoy alliance, certainly not this side of the book launch. I need Naomi to, <laughs> need Naomi to, launch, uh, to launch the book. Uh, I remember with the DUP book launch we did, yeah, and that, uh, that went well. Not, we, we, we invited, I wasn't in charge of the launch, just to disavow any responsibility for this, but we invited uh, th three speakers. One was Alex Kane, was fine, but I can't remember the others. We had a speaker who uh, attacked the DUP at the launch and Arlene, Foster was sat in the front row and interrupted the, uh, the launch to, to shout down the speaker. So, uh, so we don't want a repetition of that. I'm sure, alliance will be nice and civilised and polite, won't we? OK, so the asymmetry of perceptions, yeah. I mean, part of the, the problem with the Good Friday Agreement has been, I suppose, that people have not perceived it as, as of, of equal benefit. And I think, I'm not necessarily saying they're correct in this assumption, but this is from the 1998 Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey. And when, when we've done our own surveys, and um, subsequent life and time surveys have suggested this asymmetry of perception, this unevenness of perception has remained. Catholics tend to think that it has been of equal benefit, whereas, you know, more Protestants tend to, not overwhelmingly, but tend to think that nationalists have benefited more from the Good Friday Agreement. And that's a problem because broadly you do need an, a, uh, an evenness of perception that this deal is fair to, to both, both sides. I think it was. Uh, uh, it would be my own view, I think, in constitutional terms, it, it really was. But if one side thinks that they are losing from it and the other side thinks, no, it's fine, then again, you have a problem. And I think that is something that has never properly uh, been addressed. I think the other things to, to think about are, you know, and I'm going to come on to the sort of programme for reform, you, what I think will be useful reforms of the institutional apparatus of the Good Friday Agreement in a moment, and that's not about tearing up the Good Friday Agreement at all. As I say, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, but in terms of ideology, it was based upon unionism versus nationalism, let's be honest. And yet, you know, even at the time of, of the Good Friday Agreement, if you look at the Northern Ireland Life and Times, so this is the 2022 uh, state of play in terms of how people self-identify in ideological terms. So you see 31% unionist, 26% nationalist, 38% neither. So the largest single category of, of person here uh, in Northern Ireland, if these surveys are correct, and you know, I wouldn't dream of uh, questioning the veracity of a Queensland University of Ulster uh, uh, survey, uh, the largest single category are those saying they're neither. Can we honestly say the Good Friday Agreement is based upon the neithers? No, I mean, it's not. It's based upon a binary between unionism and nationalism. And in voting terms, that's perfectly sensible. 80% of the votes cast at the uh, first preference votes I'm talking about at the most recent elections have been for unionist and nationalist parties. And the assembly comprises around 80% uh, 
parties or MLAs who are unionist or nationalist. So in some ways the Good Friday Agreement is perfectly logical, but it's based upon voters, it's not based upon the electorate as a whole. And you might legitimately say, well, who cares if you don't vote? Um, tough. But the way the voting is structured within the Assembly obviously favours uh, unionist and nationalist parties. The votes of the others account for less. So the current situation is that neither are the largest, but the neither sometimes you hear this argument, well, the neither have really grown in size. They have grown in size. But one third of the electorate said they were neither at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. So if we go back 25 years, the neither were the second largest category then. Unionism has declined from 40% in 1998, down to 31% now. Nationalism, broadly static, just uh, uh, ticking, ticking upwards. So the neithers have never been negligible, but they were rather written out the script in 1998. I don't think there's any uh, uh, disputing that. And you might say, well, that's perfectly logical because we had to deal with a conflict between unionists and nationalists. We want to see it in those, in those terms. So it was a bit of a, uh, I can't say myopic, sort of biopic uh, uh, approach to uh, to politics, the Good Friday Agreement. It also, I mean, obviously it was an identity-based agreement. It essentialized identity. It didn't freeze identity. Other identities have come forward. You get some people, what I would term utopian integrationists, who think that it froze every identity. It froze each person's identity in 1998. You know, and that's the extreme criticism of the Good Friday Agreement I don't like. Other identities have come forward. You've had the development of uh, gay and lesbian identity, for example. You know, uh, considerable pride campaigns, etc. Other identities, it is possible to come forward. It is possible for society to change. The Good Friday Agreement doesn't simply ossify everything and the identities are left unchanged uh, as a consequence. That's simply uh, not true. But it is difficult for the neithers uh, to necessarily assert their identity. In terms of uh, identity, I mean, John Hewitt, you know, famously, was, you know, when asked to describe his identity, it was, it was a real mix. You know? Ulster, British, Irish, European. Do we accurately, is that accurately reflected uh, in terms of, uh, of the Good Friday Agreement? Um, it, it, it didn't really talk about Northern Irishness, for example, as an identity. Uh, and Northern Irishness, contrary again to some myths, hasn't actually grown uh, as an identity. It's been pretty static. The, the percentage of people who say their primary identity is Northern Irish is around a quarter of the population. That's about the same as it was at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. What there has been a growth of has been a growth of Irishness. Britishness has been in decline uh, as an identity. Okay. Then, of course, you've got the inevitable uh, instability that comes with a constitutional question, which gets lots of people, uh, other than Alliance, uh, excited. Um, the constitutional question. Uh, really, you, you'd have thought the Good Friday Agreement had sort of properly parked it rather than this endless rows about, uh, that, have, uh, that occur on an almost daily basis about where we're at in terms of the constitutional question. For the sake uh, of this particular talk, what I've done is taken the poll of polls from 2021 to 2023, okay? Um, what should the long-term policy be for Northern Ireland? Because you shouldn't, we'd, we tend to ask both questions. How would you vote if there's a border poll tomorrow? Which is a really stupid question, but we always have it in surveys. I don't, I don't know why. They probably should deny us public money for, for doing these surveys if we ask it again. Um, and you see, but the, what matters is the long-term policy. Okay. There's no doubt that post-Brexit, the gap has narrowed. If you look at that figure on the left, the 48% across the polls for the last three years, okay, of staying in the UK, that was in the 60% plus pre-Brexit. There's no doubt that the percentage in favour of Northern Ireland staying in the UK has declined. Okay. It's down by about 14, 15%. It's not that there's been a soar away leap in favour of a united Ireland. That has gone up, for sure, but it's not gone up anywhere near as much as NI in the UK uh, has come down. And then you get 13% don't know. That percentage of constitutional agnostics, not sure, uh, has increased. Okay. So there is all to play for. I naively thought that the Good Friday Agreement had parked the constitutional question in 1998 without properly reading the terms of the deal. Because in many ways, what was agreed in 1998 was an honorable compromise on the constitutional question. But it did leave a lot to be desired in terms of um, how we were gonna approach it. 
Because what it says, it doesn't say much, but it simply says the Secretary of State uh, shall decide uh, if a border poll or constitutional referendum shall take place. If he, it did say he, even though Momo Olam was Secretary of State, um, uh, if he thinks that, um, uh, that there is a majority in favour of change, of constitutional change, no criteria were offered as to how the Secretary of State should form that view, um, which people didn't think about. People were just so glad to get, understandably, it's not a criticism. People were so grateful to get the deal over the line that they thought, well, you know, okay, I'll give, it, give the power to the, to the Secretary of State without any possible conceivable criteria as to how that judgment should be formed. So how do you form the judgment? Do you use polls, that's immediate opinion polls, that immediately causes trouble because people will argue, well, online polls can be manipulated or people will say face-to-face -face polls. You get shy United Islanders still who don't reveal them. So there are arguments over the methodology of the opinion polls. Do you use election results? Do you have a pre-referendum, just asking people what you think? Focus groups, I mean, how is the judgment formed? And this has gone to the courts already. And frankly, Mr. Justice Gervin the, in the High Court in Belfast was withering over the attempt to get the Secretary of State to come up with criteria. In the view of Mr. Justice Gervin, um, it's entirely a matter of the Secretary of State and that he, again, uh, that he uh, should use whatever uh, he, as Secretary of State, thinks is appropriate. So we're not, we've not got much further as to how the Secretary of State will ever form a view. I've no doubt that if these polls were to narrow further, there would be a legal challenge coming and a determination to, to, to bring on a border poll. Equally, I've no doubt that if there, if there was a referendum tomorrow, and there isn't going to be, that there would be, at the moment, a vote for NI to stay in the UK. Okay, two more themes that I, I do want to cover in terms of thawing, because part of the, the grumbling about the Good Friday Agreement is, well, 25 years on, are we a society more uh, at ease with ourselves? And the picture, again, is, is mixed. You know, you get those who hate consociational power sharing deals saying, oh, it's terrible, we're as polarised as ever. Uh, and you get the consociational lovies saying, community autonomy, it's the right way forward. People should be able to uh, have their community autonomy. What's wrong with it? There's nothing inherently wrong with communities living cheek by jowl. Okay. Let's start with the good news. It's always the best way. Okay. Successive surveys have shown that most people believe that community relations have either stayed the same or got better. Not many takers for the idea that community relations have got worse. Okay. Uh, so generally people think, yeah, we are better. We are in a better place than we were 25 years ago. There's not been a, a single study, even when you've had problems like the flags disputes of 2012, you know, nasty, uh, nasty times for, for, for a few months, people still felt overall that community relations uh, were better. The slightly worrying thing is, over the last couple of years, the percentage uh, thinking they've got better has actually diminished uh, slightly, but still, you know, either better or the same. Uh, not many people thinking it's worse. In fact, uh, that 13% is, is one of the higher figures in recent years. Okay? So, good news. Uh, in terms of, you know, the physical monuments to division, then the news is perhaps uh, less good because only about one in five people thought the peace lines peace walls, which you have a term you want to use, should be removed now. Most people wanted them, if you add that to the 45%, wanted them removed in the, uh, in the future. But there's not a great deal of confidence saying, let's just get rid, uh, bulldoze those walls. I remember interviewing David Ford for the Alliance book. Um, uh, have I mentioned the Alliance book enough yet, just to, just to plug it? Um, it, it, it? We're hoping to get out for Christmas for perfect Christmas gift, but maybe delayed. But uh, interviewed David Ford, the, uh, the Justice Minister. Uh, he said he was proud that he got rid of six of them. And that shows the scale of it. When you've got almost 100 remaining in Belfast, then he felt that he'd, he'd done a good job and the maximum possible, and I, I, you know, I believe him. Uh, he felt pleased, relieved, proud almost that he got rid of six. So talk about way to go. Now, you can make the case that those peace walls are more porous than they used to be, and they are. People cross them in a way that they didn't back in the conflict. 
uh, taxi drivers routinely, you know, taxi will routinely cross them, and people themselves, whilst they're still reluctant to go and shop in a, uh, a cross a divide, will, will, will cross them. So we've got to be careful uh, that we don't, uh, you know, over, over darken the picture. But in some ways, it's a gloomy statistic. Then in terms of the percentage, trying to get a, a straightforward figure on the percentage of uh, schools that are integrated and uh, pupils attending integrated schools is, is surprisingly difficult, actually. In fact, to double-check the figures of the Department of Education in Northern Ireland last night, they're saying at the moment, actually, the figures are, w are worse, if you think this is an issue. 5%, uh, they're saying that only 5% only of schools are integrated. This is, on, this is on the Department of Education for Northern Ireland's own website, and only 7% of pupils are, are educated at integrated schools. I've gone for the, the higher figure uh, that I found uh, elsewhere. That's juxtaposed with the situation where more than two-thirds of parents say that they want their kids to be integrated, to, to attend integrated schools. Okay. Do we believe those parents or, you know, now that Kelly Armstrong's bill has been passed and there has to be, by law, equal provision for integrated education, do we expect a flow of kids to go into integrated schools? I remain slightly sceptical of this, partly because of residential segregation and partly because, whoops, that was just to show, not stop me overrunning. Um, okay, I'm not even on to the institutional reforms yet. Um, right. Um, what will be the take-up? I think now we will at least be able to test this um, in a way uh, that we've not seen previously because there's a statute of responsibility now to offer equal provision for integrated education. I think that's easier said than done, but it'd be really interesting to see. Does it matter that children attend the same faith schools? Is it still about a constitutional, is it a constitutional thing that matters? I mean, you know, I work in a city where there's more faith schools than anywhere else in England. Liverpool had its sectarian problems. They died out, but kid, Catholic kids still go to Catholic schools. So is it schooling that's the issue, or is it a bigger thing? And I think that's the test. Um, and there are some who would regard themselves as liberals and are pro-integrated education. Interviewing John Alderdice, he said, liberals overstate the value of integrated education as a solution to problems. Those hypotheses will be tested. Um, I remember slightly sceptical that integrated education uh, will, be, will be, have the take-up uh, that uh, people might expect. And that's partly because of the last thing that there was a real problem in working class areas, residential segregation remains the norm. Uh, and until you tackle that, you've got a problem integrating uh, schools anyway. The final area, you need to hear, the final area is what to do about the institutions. And this, there is a real risk that this looks like the Alliance Party Manifesto. Agenda for reform, uh, yeah. could there be more damning criticism? No, that's not, uh, no, no. Uh, an agenda for reform, externally broken. Uh, um, Agenda for reform. First of all, I'd love there to be an external broker because I don't think the parties themselves can introduce some of the reforms that might be useful for Stormont. Right? I'd like the Americans to be, I'd like a son or daughter of Senator Mitchell to try and broker this. It might not have the, the urgency of 1998, but I think it'd still be useful because I don't have implicit faith in the parties or the British and Irish governments to be able to broker significant institutional reform themselves. Okay? Let's rattle through these for the sake of time to go to questions. Retitling of First and Deputy First Ministers. That ship's probably sailed, but it should have been done long ago. They should never have been called First and Deputy First Ministers. Uh, uh, but it's very, it matters a great deal. The Assembly, I remember giving a talk to the Assembly Commission. And I had, they told me off, they said, Deputy should be lowercase d. So, you know, if it's lowercase d, they're not equals then, are they? Uh, first and Deputy First Minister. Uh, they're co-First Ministers. They should have been called that. But... I suspect Sinn Féin won't change now in the same way the DUP uh, didn't change. Secondly, do we need a Deputy First Minister? It's always the Deputy First Minister that walks out. So do, do we <laughs> you know, get, get rid of the post? Do we need a Deputy First Minister? It's a semi-serious question. Why? You know, if you're going to, you can always rotate the First Minister. If it was about power sharing and it's such symbolic importance, then rotate the First Minister after a couple of years. Okay. Thirdly, you know, if a batter doesn't come to the crease in time, oh, it was at Manchester, it doesn't matter if it just rains where I come from, but, um, but if a batter doesn't get to the crease in time, they're timed out, they get a certain amount of time. Now, I'm not suggesting two minutes to form an executive uh, like cricket, but uh, time at the vetoes, so that there is a long standoff period where the parties can make clear that they don't like uh, X, Y, or Z, but ultimately the baton could pass on to the next largest party of nationalism or unionism or to the others. Uh, time limit the vetoes, so you could still have a veto, but not forever, to try and lessen the length of it. 
Fourthly, uh, the clues in the title really, you know, Democratic Unionist Party or Ulster Unionist Party, uh, and we know really what, what Sinn Féin stands for, you know, what the STLP stands for. So do we need communal designations as the first thing that an MLA does when they arrive at Stormont? Do we need communal designations? You could just designate as a human being and vote on uh, matters accordingly. Um, abolish communal designations or the compromise would be to only have the communal designations in play for certain votes, a small number of votes. Replace them with weighted majority voting. It's not a panacea. Some of those difficult power sharing uh, countries that I mentioned earlier, they have weighted majority voting and they still have political paralysis. So I don't pretend that having weighted majority voting of say 70% uh, majorities to pass a measure in the assembly will solve all the difficulties. There's nothing beyond the change of political attitudes that can solve everything. These are just possibilities for reform. Okay? I think the, the worries about petitions of concern are gone. Uh, no party is at 30 MLAs, at which point you, have, you can go for a petition of concern and you need the support of two parties anyway now. I think they were a problem. Two petitions of concern were a problem from 2011 to 2016. That solved itself. A clear system of government and opposition was only very briefly tried. 2016 to 2017, and it's worth another go. It'd be helpful to have an opposition. The SDLP are going into it, should the institutions come back, by the fact that they haven't got enough to be in the executive. It'd be interesting to see how they get on in, in opposition. Constructive opposition may be useful, but we do need a government to actually oppose. That would help. Uh, a voluntary coalition executive to replace a mandatory one, that would be useful again. But I have to say, word of caution, when we did the focus groups, uh, when, when my colleagues, I should say, Sean Hockey and Jamie Powell at Queen's did the focus groups, people were worried. They, they thought that if you only had nationalists in government or you only had unionists in government, that would not work. So you do still need, if you want to call them both sides uh, in government, okay? It doesn't simply necessarily have to be the largest party on that side. People were worried about a one ideology uh, government. So. We need to proceed with caution on that. Final one seems to be strikingly obvious. If I don't turn up at the University of Liverpool, um, I don't, wouldn't really expect to, to get paid, uh, although some colleagues do, I should say. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but, but, um, uh, but, you know, the norm in most occupations is if you, you need to turn up to get paid. The Secretary of State says that it's beyond, that he couldn't legislate to ensure that it was the party that walked out that no longer got paid. Well, you're the Secretary of State, legislate to do that. I mean, you know, it's, that's, that's nonsense. The Secretary of State, of course, could legislate. So, well, okay, well, you walk out, fair enough, you've taken a politically principled decision, but I'm damned if you're paying your salary. That seems to me eminently, eminently fair. I don't think it's a panacea again. The DUP have said that, you know, I think it was Edwin Poots said that he'd eat dust rather than uh, go back in the current circumstances. So we'll see. So to finish, uh, GFA, great, successful deal, security-wise, self-evident. The public has not lost faith. We shouldn't lose faith in the institutions. It is time to reform the model. Uh, be careful how we tread because you can't simply exclude one ideology from government, but it doesn't necessarily have to be all the parties uh, within that government. And so, to final point, better is possible. But you have to have genuine acceptance of the equal legitimacy of both traditions, which was built into the Good Friday Agreement, but still hasn't properly happened. And above all, You've got to end the arguments about the past which debilitate this place. You're not going to agree the past. It's hard enough to agree the present. Forget trying to agree the past. Just accept that you'll always disagree the past and that'll be the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Hello. I'm a historian. I don't want people to stop thinking about the past and the, the kind of foundations that led for where we are now uh, and so forth. But I, I know what you mean. Uh, if we could find some way of uh, acknowledging that those things happened for particular reasons that really don't matter anymore, so forth, you know. Thank you for that. There are so many things that I could ask, and thank you very much. I know uh, Jonathan cut uh, short um, his presentation so to give you all the chance to ask questions and so forth. I'm looking forward to that. Um, 
what do I want to ask? I love this idea of, um, you know, it's dysfunctional what we have got, but it's popular. Uh, that's good. Um, <laughs> one thing I was thinking uh, about was this whole notion that um, Storm doesn't have power. And I'm sure there are quite a lot of us who would say, thank God for that. Uh, but looking at what's been going on, you know, we talked about the mess of our parliament. Hey. <laughs> uh, given um, the machinations of, the, uh, of both parties, really, in the UK, both main parties, uh, I'm sort of glad we're not you, you know, uh, uh, because we've seen <laughs> quite a lot of abuse of the power. Um, and I'm wondering if that has made much difference to the should we stay or should we go question. Uh, you know, I, I've looked at it and thought, I don't believe we live in a country where these things can happen. I mean, satirists must have had, you know, <laughs> how could you find anything more cynical or satirical than what was being said and done uh, by UK government over the last few years? You know, it's been amazing. Uh, seems to have settled. Hopefully it is now settled. But has that had an impact on, on how people think about being British? Yeah. Uh Great questions, Bill. I mean, um, uh, dysfunctional but popular. I mean, that, that applies to a whole range of sectors, the, the university sector above all. I mean, uh, you know, popularity continues to in increase as, as the system, the se sector is often in chaos. Better than Westminster is probably the most damning with faint praise uh, uh, <laughs> that, that, that you could imagine. But, but it's, it's true. In, in a lot of terms, Stormont is. If you look, for example, at the representativeness of the Assembly, it's it's nearly perfect. You've got a very good voting system, single transferable vote, proportional representation, basically the parties broadly in proportion. J Jim Allister, TUV, might have something to say about that, having got 8% of the first preference votes and only, only himself uh, within the Assembly. But, you know, there are many things I think that Westminster could actually learn from aspects of, of, of Stormont, which might sound strange. But, I mean, that's, that's not good enough either. I, th I think in terms of, of Westminster, you'll have a period of relative stability uh, now uh, under Sunak. I mean, things will quieten down. I mean, you're never uh, going to replicate the chaos of Boris Johnson and 59 resignations in one evening. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> just absolutely unprecedented. Um, you've had all, all the convulsions associated with Brexit, which has, it's not fundamentally real to the constitutional dial here, but you saw, you know, the, the narrowing of the polls. I think we're, we'd expect a quieter period. I mean, the sort of, Sort of managerial dullness, if you want to call it, of Keir Starmer, likely to be uh, our next Prime Minister. I'm still torn as to whether he'll get an overall majority, uh, but I think it'd be a, rel a quieter period uh, at Westminster. I think what'll be interesting, I think, is whether, if there's no overall majority at Westminster, as to whether how far the Lib Dems will push for some radical changes to the system there in terms of PR and possible changes to the voting system. So I think that could be an interesting period in that sense uh, in British politics. But yeah, I mean, ultimately all that long list of institutional reforms that I offered, nothing's going to change unless you have parties that really want to make mm. the institutions work. Right? Each party would, would argue on its own terms it had very good reasons to walk out. Uh, whether it be the, the old rows about IRAD commissioning in 2002 and the collapse of the Assembly then, Sinn Féin, RHI, uh, Irish language, etc., 2017, the DUP, opposition to the protocol, now Windsor Framework, each on their own terms are logical, plausible reasons to quit the institutions. But, you know, the sum of the parts is mm. dysfunctionality. That's, that's, yeah. that, therein lies the problem. I, I think mm. one, of, one of the... Uh, times when many of us, and especially those neithers, uh, really got a bit of a shock about our ability to work within what we have, uh, was when the majority here voted against leaving the EU, and, some, and we discovered that uh, was no problem. We we had to had to go because Johnson said we had to go. I think many people knew the disaster, and I, I think it has been a disaster that that has been and has changed relationships. We were talking about this yesterday morning. Uh, the change that that has meant for people on both 
parts of this island that we're not seen as part of Europe anymore. And I mean, I honestly think that, you know, this idea, and it sounded so glib, you've got the best of both worlds. You know, um, you've, you've got access to the European Union, but you're, you're you know, you're also oops, part of Britain. I thought that was great. Uh, and of, of course, that's unacceptable to so many. Well, Brexit has created two constitutional minorities now. There isn't, whichever survey you use, the most that you're seeing Northern Ireland staying in the UK is around 50%, and generally it's coming in just shy mm. of that. 37% uh, the average for a United Ireland, and the don't knows now exceed mm -hmm. the difference between the two sides. And it's those, the don't knows, and, and they, for some of them, uh, uh, United Ireland within the EU will be an attractive proposition. Mm -hmm. And it's those that have to one over, one over, and you know, you talk, speak to the smarter people in Sinn Féin, they're fully cognizant of that. They, they, they know that they are uh, the people that need to be won over. Um, uh, how they'll go, I think, will depend upon. It's not reducible to economics, but that will be a major factor as to how the UK economy prospers or doesn't relative to the EU and how the EU performs uh, over the next few years. So there is a state of constitutional flux that the constitutional question was never fully parked. You get these sort of narratives of it was, was all well, you know, I've been to enough uh, Sinn Féin conferences over the, over the years, so since the first one was about 1996, and I have to do all the rounds, you, you, think, <laughs> you think this job's easy, I have to go to all the party conferences. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they'd never abandoned their constitutional ambitions, but obviously Brexit has mm -hmm. put a lot of wind, wind in the sails mm. for, the, for those wanting in United Ireland, because there's a section, you know, there's a substantial section of, of it, uh, and you know, there are more Again, shameless book plug. But the, the, there are more Alliance Party members now who favour United Ireland than, the, mm. than don't. So there again There's is a sign. There's a great leader, mind you. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I think that yeah. makes a difference. Mm. It's something yeah. we're very short of in, in this mm. country. OK, um, we'll open up the questions. Um, there first and then over here. Uh, yeah. John, what do you think it says about our maturity that none of the social changes that have taken place in terms of equality legislation, in terms of gay legislation, in terms of abortion, in terms of all those things, none of those pieces of legislation have been passed by a storm in Parliament. Yeah. The only piece of legislation that was passed by a storm in Parliament that changed things was under the coercion of the British government in 1970. Uh, we've not been capable of grappling about any of those things. And some of us can say, thank God that the Brits did it for us. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point. Quite right. Westminster had to legislate on same-sex marriage, had to legislate uh, on abortion. You were never going to get consensus in the Assembly. There were only ever two Unionist MLAs who voted in favour of same-sex marriage. And I can't remember whether any of you ever uh, supported change to the... Um, to the abortion laws, so you, you were simply not going to get it. Now, people say, well, uh, the vetoes that were built into the Good Friday Agreement were, were never meant to be played on social issues, but the Good Friday Agreement never said that. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement built in those vetoes, and they could be used for anything. And so the argument came more vociferously from the DUP than the UUP was, we are representing the interests of the unionist community by opposing same-sex marriage and by opposing change to abortion. If you look at, again, and I know there's always a risk of political scientists getting boring about survey evidence, there were more DUP voters in 2019 actually supported the legalisation of same-sex marriage than were opposed. But on ter in terms of abortion, we didn't find many takers for the legislation that's been introduced uh, amongst the unionist commun community, uh, generally felt it had been too liberal. So it's, it, it's a mixed picture. Um, that's, I think it's really important in terms of the DUP's disillusionment with, with Stormont isn't just about the protocol. Some of the DUP disillusionment among some of their MLAs with Stormont preceded it because they were sick of being overridden by Westminster on things like abortion and same-sex marriage. They, that really uh, annoyed them. Um, and it's part, that's, I think, part, and the Irish language, of course. So that, I think, has, has contributed to the reluctance of some to go back. They think, well, you know direct rule from Westminster, is it, is, is it any more hideous in their worldview uh, than, than what we've got now? So I think social issues mattered in, in that sense. But no one ever specified what the vetoes 
it should be four. That left, you know, the DUP, given its religious history, to, to obviously you see that as an opportunity to, to go down that route. And significant as those social issues are, I think it's important to highlight that we have the highest child poverty rate in the UK and Ireland. We now have the highest domestic homicide rate in relation to females since um, uh, lockdown. Um, what's the, th the third one I'm trying to remember? And our suicide rate has now extended the deaths of those um, related to the troubles in terms of transgenerational trauma and mental health issues. So I recognise those social issues, but actually the social issues that need the donkey work. And yes, we want to look at peace lines, and yes, we want to look at all those, and we want to look at integrated education. But really, the overriding issue is poverty. And Brexit um, had a massive impact in terms of, of community funding in Northern Ireland. Anybody in this room who was waiting for funding on the 31st of March will know exactly what I mean. Um, so as much as yes, we're getting the best of both worlds, there are communities now um, have zero funding for, the, for essential um, services. So depending on where you sit, um, this place is more of a mess than across the border. And getting up and going to work, if you're working in the community these days, is very, very challenging. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think it's to the bafflement of many across... These three in the front, next, uh, sorry. <laughs> across the water that people row about the flags and emblems and symbols when, uh, over here, when there is endemic poverty in, in certain areas. It's, it, it, it's a head scratcher to many who don't understand the salience of identity issues uh, over the water. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better because I think it's, whilst the term punitive budget has perhaps been, been overused slightly, there's, there's no doubt that um, I think Chris Eaton Harris is pretty unsympathetic uh, at the moment. I mean, the British government, rather than thinking, how do we tackle poverty in Northern Ireland, is thinking at the moment, how do we get the place to pay its way? That's, that's the attitude of the British government at the moment. How much that would change if you had a Labour government, if Peter Carr becomes the next Secretary of State, I'm not sure is, is, uh, is an honest answer. But at the moment, th the British government is thinking more water charges, higher tuition fees, whatever, putting costs up, rather than trying to uh, come up with schemes to alleviate poverty uh, in this place. And that, that's the, um, uh, the, the blunt truth. In terms of, I mean, you know, in terms of parties that would simply concentrate on those issues, again, you know, does it pay for them electorally, though? I mean, people before profit elected, but they, they've, I mean, they, they, they've been in electoral decline in the last few years. So, you know, and how much the other parties truly focus on it yeah, they'll all attack a British Secretary of State for not giving enough to this place, but, but you know, I don't see a set of policies. How, how much power Stormont has as well to actually tackle it, even though there was a functioning assembly, would help. But how much difference it would make, I think it would be more marginal than, than transformative, the, is what uh, I'd say. Look, we're running rapidly out of time, so could we take the next, I think there's three here, Doreen, and yourself, and there, and then I think we'll have to. He'll be back later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. I'll, I'll um, endorse your optimism and then challenge your optimism. <clears throat> I'll endorse your optimism. You spoke internationally, had examples of Belgium, Bosnia, Iraq, and Lebanon. And <clears throat> it came, I observed this as well about the professional civil service that we have although it has its criticisms. If you look at other divided societies, when the civil service itself, itself is corrupted by politics, then you know, it's really difficult to find any way out. So it's something we forget, is, is that we have a professional civil service that attempts to provide services with all of its challenges. Um, my challenge to you, because um, you quoted John Hewitt in regards to mixed identities, is your proposal for, um, say, voluntary power sharing um, which I personally endorse, but the challenges in regards to collective responsibility, and even just listening to your, your presentation, I don't hear from you or anyone that anyone in this political society has any stomach for collective responsibility, um, and I'd like you to 
counter, counter that, thanks. Um, could we take these last two, uh, uh, very quickly please, I'm sorry, we're, uh, the coffee will be out. <laughs> um, do you think it makes sense to continue to distinguish the two groups as Catholic and Protestant, that is to say by religion? Because like, you had a slide up there that said that 90% of council estates are religiously segregated, but the thing is, most of those people aren't even religious. Yet we're still saying it's about Catholic and Protestants. It's it's not. It was the troubles was not a religious conflict. So, okay, okay. Doreen, have a quick say. I just want to say how much more cheerful I am than you about integrated <laughs> education. I was one of the directors of All Children Together that started it, and no matter where we went, we were called grumpy old woman. <laughs> Never. Well, I am a grumpy yeah. old woman, so that yeah. was fair enough, right. but it was a really, really hard fight. Yeah. Now, um, the integrated education movement is making tremendous strides forward during the last year. There's even a, a school in Balameda, of all places, that's turning integrated. Mm. And that gives me hope for the future. Thank you, Doreen. Um, could I ask, I'm terribly sorry, a, a sort of quick round up? Yeah. Uh, because right. the coffee and scones will be downstairs, okay? Right. No one should come before people on coffee. So, right, quickly, uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service, if I was a Northern Ireland Civil Servant, I'd be wanting two salaries. They're, they are running the country uh, in, a, in a fine way. It's, it's outrageous, <laughs> right? Uh, sense of lack of, I thought, yeah, I agree with you, Alan. A lack of collective responsibility is, is a problem. Ultimately, for all those institutional reforms, I suggest, it is still attitudinal change that is required above all else. You can have every single one of those institutional reforms. It won't make a scrap of difference if people don't really deep down care whether the institutions work or not. In terms of the, the housing, uh, I use the figures from Northern Ireland Housing Executive because they don't use the term unionist and nationalist. So they don't presume people's politics. So they work on um, Catholic and Protestant. I agree. You know, I, I made a facetious tweet uh, at the time of the Northern Ireland Census saying, you know, so many Protestants and Catholics, the churches will be packed on, on Sunday because you have this figure of, you know, 90 odd percent of people Protestant or Catholic, which we know, you know, is, you know the priests will be absolutely delighted and, and uh, Church of uh, Ireland ministers, if, if, if it was really like that. The community background is still used. I agree, it is dated. Um, in terms of the last one, on integrated education, I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree, except the comparison with Liverpool is... is but, but it shows that you know you could still have you can still have religiously segregated education and sectarianism come with her okay if you don't have an attendant constitutional question which we didn't have in, in liverpool that was the point i was trying to make uh you know i sent one of my children to catholic school and other two others to, to school, schools that are not religiously segregated i do think kelly armstrong's bill could be a game changer but you're going to have to end working class residential segregation if for it to truly work um that We'll have to we'll have a programme accompanying it to get kids into integrated schools. That was the point I was trying to make. Thank, thank you very much yes. indeed. As you see, we... <laughs> Everyone's wanting to take full advantage of you being here. Um, John is here uh, for the rest of today and tonight, I think. Uh, but he does want to see a bit of our mass, so don't hound him too much. Uh, but he will be uh, on the Slugger O'Toole panel at 7 o'clock this evening. So again, you'll have what I'm sure will be very lively discussion about these issues. Your coffee's downstairs. Thanks again to John.